1 Corinthians 13. I will show you the most excellent way. If I speak in the tongues of men or of angels, but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient, love is kind. It does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud. It does not dishonor others, it is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered, it keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. But where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when completeness comes, what is in part disappears. When I was a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put the ways of childhood behind me. For now we see only a reflection as in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. But now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. Uh, well, before we come and we open God's word together this morning, let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we sang a few moments ago that Jesus loves us. And we want to thank you this morning for your love that has been shown towards each one of us in the gift of your Son, Jesus. He died for us. He took our sins from us. He rose again so that we might know you in a very personal way. But Father, this morning as we come to open your word, this great chapter about love, what it is, how it's to be expressed, Father, we pray that your Holy Spirit might indeed come and overflow us with your love. Father, forgive your servant, for his sins are many. We have come this morning to see Jesus afresh. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Albert went to college, and while he was at college, he met a girl called Maliva. Although Albert found school rather difficult, he, she encouraged him and helped him when he was uh, very discouraged. And over time, their relationship blossomed into love. During a period in which they were separated, Albert wrote to Maliva this love letter. When I'm not with you, I feel as if I'm not whole. I miss you. I can go anywhere I want, but I belong nowhere, and I miss your two little arms and that glowing mouth full of tenderness and kisses. A passionate letter. A year later, they married, and he poured himself into his work. She cared for their children and tended to the house, but slowly, over time, they grew apart. After 11 years of marriage, he accepted a very prestigious new job 
And just before they moved house to this new city, he wrote her another letter. It was outlined by number and letter the terms of their relationship if they were to stay together. He wrote this. She would renounce all personal relationships with me except when these are required to keep up social appearances. She was not to ask him to sit with her at home or to go out or to travel with him. He ordered her to keep his clothes in order to serve him three meals a day in his room. She was to keep his bedroom and study clean. Then he added this, You will promise explicitly to observe the following points in any contact with me. You will expect no affection from me, and you will not reproach me for this. You must answer me at once when I speak to you. You must leave my bedroom or study at once without protesting when I ask you to go. You will promise not to denigrate me in the eyes of our children, either by word or deed. Interesting letters. Is it any wonder that Mr. and Mrs. Albert Einstein divorced four years later? For all his genius, Albert Einstein was a miserable failure at comprehending or maintaining a loving relationship. All the intellectual gifts that he had proved meaningless in the larger context of life. Well, very sadly, we could probably number couples by their thousands who have settled for relationships where they simply coexist. Their relationship is more as business partners than as husband and wife. And add to that number all of those parents and children who are constantly at odds with each other. Somehow, we as a society have begun to believe that tragic commentary uh, in Tina Turner's song, Love is Just a Second-Hand Emotion. And anyone who has watched love drain out of their relationships, or a child, or a friend's relationship, knows that without love, there is no relationship. All that is left, as in the Einsteins' relationship, is a business arrangement. And so that leads us to the question at the outset this morning, how can we build or rebuild loving relationships? And so for that, the answer, we're going to work our way through 1 Corinthians 13. It's referred to often as the love chapter. But it's a chapter that is sandwiched between a much bigger and broader discussion of spiritual gifts in the life of a very young, divided, fighting church. And Paul, as he's writing to these young believers, pauses for a moment And then he wants to point out to this divided people that if they don't learn to relate to each other in love, then the little that they do, regardless of the spiritual gifts that they have, won't make much difference to God or to others. And so the next few weeks, we're going to work our way through this chapter. It's a chapter that is often read at weddings. It's kind of as if this is the love instruction manual for couples. But it's not. It's far from that. This chapter, this book, is addressed to young believers who are endeavoring to work together as a church, seeking to be a witness in a very sensual Roman city of Corinth in the first century. And the truth is this, 
they're not doing very well. And so as we unpack this passage together, we need to remember that Paul is being very direct. He's not writing about some syrupy emotionalism, but he's drawing forth the strong virtue of love that he recognizes is both tough and tender. This letter to Corinth was originally penned to people who were very gifted, but they couldn't get along. And Paul intends to repair that which is being broken, to correct that which is going off course. And so we need to study this chapter in the context of the rest of Paul's letter to these young believers in Corinth. Otherwise, this chapter remains just mere words. They may be noble words. They may be ennobling words. But they're only words. But when we apply these words of Paul to ourselves, to the local church, these words become dynamite. They uncover something of all of our weaknesses, all of our gaps, all of our failures. They uncover the sins that are found in any Christian community. In other words, these words of Paul cut us down to size. They humble us. And we begin to realize what really matters to God. They redirect us as God's people to our true calling. And so it'll be good for us to assess our life together in the mirror of this chapter. This chapter is often acknowledged to be great literature. But this chapter also needs to be linked with all that's gone immediately before it. With Paul's discussion of spiritual gifts in chapter 12. And in a word, we can summarize it in this way, that Paul says that all the most dramatic and all the most wonderful gifts we can imagine are useless without love. F.F. F. Bruce was an English uh, Bible commentator And in his commentary, he makes this reflection, that the most lavish exercise of spiritual gifts cannot compensate for the lack of love. So before we look at what Paul says about love, just a couple of comments. It's well known that the Greek word for love in the New Testament is a word called agape. This is a word that is not found in common usage in the Greek language. It's a new word. And it's Paul who introduces this word into the Greek of the New Testament. Agape is the love of God that is seen in in Jesus of Nazareth. And it requires a whole new word to describe it, to understand it, because no other word in the Greek language at that time would be able to do so. And this word agape talks about God's love as a love that completely transcends all of human ideas or expressions of love. Someone stated the meaning of agape is this. It is a love for the utterly unworthy, a love which proceeds from a God who is love. It is a love lavished on others without a thought of whether they're worthy to receive it or not. It proceeds from the nature of the lover rather than from any merit in the beloved. And this is the love, according to Jesus, that has to characterize and needs to control the Christian community 
if Jesus is going to be recognized as God's Son and the world's Savior. And so for these reasons, Paul spells out why the Christian community life without love is nothing. Or in verses 1 to 3, worse than nothing. And then he goes on in verses 4 to 7 to describe what love is, what love is not, and what love does. And then in verses 8 to 13, Paul paints very vividly the lasting and eternal quality of love. And very pointedly, he states that love outlives both knowledge and spiritual gifts, the two great priorities for these young Christians in Corinth. So let's dig in. Very simply, three three, uh, truths or principles this morning. Paul makes three very strong statements about loveless Christians, and he, which he calls the most excellent way at the end of chapter 12 and verse 31. And the first point is this, that without love, I offend others. Note in verse 1, If I speak in the tongues or languages of men or of angels, but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. Now, if we turn back in the book to chapter 8 and verse 1, Paul states this, We know that we all possess knowledge, but knowledge puffs up while love builds up. In other words, when spiritual gifts are operating properly, when they are exercised in love, not with a competitive spirit, the whole body of believers is built up. Now, we discover, one through history, but also through the New Testament, that the church at Corinth was full of very proud, gifted, divisive people. They boasted of their spirituality, how good they were, how spiritual they were, despite the fact that they continually argued among each other, they took each other to court, they splintered the congregation. And this first verse suggests that any such boasting about how good I am, how spiritual I am, rings hollow if our relationships are strained or they're stressed by discord or by lack of love. Paul says, all this bragging simply, uh, simply sounds like a resounding gong and clanging cymbals. And Paul's constant plea throughout his discussion of prophecy and tongues in chapter 14 He says that the inevitable result of not using spiritual gifts in love simply causes others to be offended. Now, it's interesting, Paul illustrates this with an indirect reference to the followers of the Greek mystery cults which were very popular in Corinth. Because you see, The people who lived in Corinth, it was a Roman town, been uh, formed by the Greeks uh, years previously. The people who lived at Corinth worshipped primarily two Greek gods. One was the Greek god Dionysus, the other was Cybele. Dionysus was worshipped with great orgiastic rites the prostitutes would be brought in to their parties. Part of their worship included the tearing into pieces and devouring of animals, possibly also human sacrifices. And these worshippers, especially the women, would lose their own personality, probably because of drunkenness, because Dionysus was the god of wine. Sibel, 
was the goddess or the mistress of wild nature. She's often pictured with lions and other beasts. Sibel had great uh, popularity during the first century AD of the Roman Empire, especially among women. In both of these groups, the followers of Dionysus, the followers of Sibel, celebrated their allegiance to these gods. And they would parade through the streets of Corinth with noisy gongs and clashing cymbals. This was the feature of their worship of these two gods. So they would use, in Greek language, a chorkus or a gong. It was a piece of copper that they would bang on. They would use a kimbalon or a cymbal from which the word is taken. This was a single-toned instrument that was incapable of producing anything near melody. And both of these instruments were used in this cultic religion. They would march through the streets, banging these noisy gongs and cymbals. They would be trying to invoke these two gods to come and drive away the demons, to give them prosperity, to rouse the worshippers. They were neither melodious, nor were they capable of producing harmony. Both beat out a very heavy monotone, which caused as much offence to all their neighbours as constantly barking dogs. And so equally offensive, maintains Paul, that those who use the gift of speaking in tongues without controlling the motive of love, and it doesn't matter whether the tongues are human languages, as they often seem to be, or whether it's the language of heaven, which some people assume. Paul says, if there is no love, you simply come across as being unattractive and uncouth. And it does appear that there were some Christians with this particular gift who were insensitively trying to impose it on others in their congregation. And so they would parade their gift with considerable self-indulgence rather than a deep desire to build up their brothers and sisters, members of their church. And Paul is saying here that such people override the feelings of those who are either unaccustomed or unsympathetic to this gift. Without love, I offend others. The second principle is this, that without love, I am nothing. Verse 2, if I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge. And if I have a faith that can move mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If acting without love actively repels people from church and the gospel, then it becomes a huge obstacle to effective witness in our community but it also empties the Christian of their significance before God. The believer becomes a non-entity, a nobody. And the truth here that Paul is expressing is that God cannot use loveless Christians for His glory, even if they're gifted with prophetic speaking. Even if they're able to sit and to understand and explain the deep things of God and man and Satan, of this world and other worlds, even if they're knowledgeable about the vast fields of truth and experience, even if they have the most incisive and bold measure of faith envisaged by Jesus himself, a faith which moves mountains, they're nothing. Now, it would be tempting to assume that Paul is is using rather bombastic language here, that he's, 
he's using preacher's license. He's exaggerating the situation in this passage so that the full impact and the, and the value of these important gifts is, is simply diminished when love doesn't flow. But that's not what Paul writes here. Paul is stating very, very pointedly that if there is no love, there is nothing of any real value in my ministry or our ministry. We may be successful. We may get results. We may be admired. We may be appreciated, we may be applauded, but as far as God and eternity are concerned, I am nothing. Could there be any spiritual experience that could compare to this? I mean, imagine it. To be able to fathom all mysteries and all knowledge Surely, that would be the ultimate experience of life. That you know everything about everything. Paul says, no. Not at all. Paul says it would be meaningless. It adds absolutely nothing to an individual stature with God or man. Or as someone wisely said, people don't care how much you know till they know how much you care. In other words, love matters much more than gifts. And Paul is stating very clearly here, you Corinthians clearly think that because you possess these gifts, you're extremely important person. Let me tell you, not only are you unimportant, you're actually nothing. And then the third truth, without love, I gain nothing. Verse 3, if I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Paul mentions here two two acts of self-sacrifice, which most closely approximate to practical love of the most purest and unselfish kind. Paul says, "What what if in one grand sweeping gesture I was to give away everything I owned. Oh, something else. What if I were to hand over my body to be sacrificed, to be burned on behalf of others? Aren't such actions inherently valuable in the sight of God? Don't they achieve something for the kingdom of God? Aren't If I did that, wouldn't it be commendable? Wouldn't it be praiseworthy? And Paul says, no. Not at all. Because those actions are being uh, motivated by self-interest, not by the interests of others. So nothing is gained. All my effort... All my giving, all my sacrifice, it's just wasted. Now, brothers and sisters, dare I say this? We've all heard promises made by politicians. Have you ever heard one of our politicians boast about their incredible love for people? Very rare. Most of the time when you listen to politicians speak, they simply repeat the word I in a hundred different ways. Is it any wonder that we as a culture are cynical 
about the motives of politicians. Well, Paul reminds us how true it is that words and actions that lack genuine love accomplish little to help others. I dare to say this morning that Australia, Australian society is much like Corinth was. It's a very self-centred society. Is it any wonder in our communities that relationships deteriorate so quickly? And if relationships are strained to the point of breaking, perhaps the first question an individual needs to ask themselves is this, well, am I just being selfish? Because the whole message of our culture is this, is it not? Look out for your best interests. Take care of yourself. Don't let anyone get the better of you. Now, as followers of Jesus, as people who want to honor Jesus in our lives, we know that God has demonstrated genuine love toward us. The scripture's full of his active love toward his children. Think about the most famous text in scripture, one that many of you would have learned at Sunday school long ago, John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. God's love for us demonstrates self-denial. He gave his one and only son so that we might be forgiven and set free. So this is our model. We're called to love and to serve others with this kind of love. Can we recall the words of Paul in the book of Philippians? Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. Some of you may have heard of Nelson and Virginia Bell. They were the parents of Ruth Graham, Billy Graham's wife. And when they got older, Dr. Bell had to care for his wife. And on one occasion, Ruth Graham recounts how she entered her parents' home. There was her father and there was her mother. And he found her father on his hands and knees, putting stockings on the feet and the legs of Mrs. Bell. And Dr. Bell looked up at his daughter Ruth as she stood at the door and observed this. And she says, I never forget his words. My father said to me, you know, the greatest privilege of my life is taking care of your mother. Brothers and sisters, in our relationships, true love, agape love, godly love is expressed towards others as a result of God's great grace and great love toward each one of us. Let's pray.
Our Heavenly Father, we want to thank you this morning for your love toward us. It's undeserved. It's unwarranted. We thank you for those wonderful words that we have known for so long, that you love this world so much that you gave your only son. Father, you loved each one of us so much that you gave your only son for us. Father, we pray that you might take the words that have been said this morning, that your spirit might sow its seed, his seed within our hearts, that we might be men and women who seek to love God and to love others, and that we do it with an agape love, a love that gives, a love that costs, a love that serves. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.